Shalom guys, welcome back to another episode here at Yashav Youth Ministries with Casa de Israel. Thank you again for being there. So we'll continue uh, with the Torah portions. Uh, this week's Torah portion is Mishpatim. Um, and so we're continuing the narrative of, of Israel, uh, exit from um, Egypt, and how now, after being re redeemed, um, they're brought to the mountain, right? This holy mountain where God revealed himself to Moses. And now he's going to reveal himself to the people. Um, and so, in last week's Torah portion, we saw how uh, after Jethro, uh, Moses' father-in-law, advises him on uh, how to uh, judge and, 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 and gather a group of men, wise men, that uh, can be trust, trusted and are good men that will do God's will um, so that he can relieve some of the load of his of his shoulders and focus on his his function and his mission and so uh now we are uh following up on the commands and the instructions right because last week uh god introduced the ten commandments and and the reason why we stopped at the ten commandments is because the people couldn't handle uh after the tenth they said moses you talk to adonai to elohim and we will do as he says and so Moses uh, is given the opportunity and the responsibility to represent the people uh, by God and by the people. And so we're here uh, and we're going to study this Torah portion a little bit, um, review some things and talk about some others. Uh, and hopefully uh, we can have some fun to learn. So let's do a Torah blessing. Bless Adonai who is blessed, blessed Adonai who is blessed now and forever, blessed are you Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has chosen us from among the peoples and given us the Torah, blessed are you Adonai who gives the Torah. Amen. Like I said, this week's story portion Mishpatim, Exodus 21, verse 1, to Exodus 24, verse 18. The uh, half Torah portion of the prophets is Jeremiah, chapter 34, verses 8 through 22, and uh, chapter 33, uh, verses 25 to 26. And the Brikhalashah New Testament portion is Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. Last week's Torah portion, Jitro explained that exactly seven weeks after the exodus from Egypt, which is 49 days after the first Passover, Moses gathered the Israelites at the foot of the mountain of Mount Sinai to enter into the covenant with uh, the Lord. This week's Torah portion of Mishpatim begins with Moses in the cloud of thick darkness, receiving additional instructions uh, regarding civil law for the Israelites. And the Jewish sages traditionally count 53 distinct commands in this portion of the Torah making it one of the most legalistic sections of the entire Bible. So, these first chapters containing the first body of Torah legislation have become known in English as the Book of the Covenant, Hebrew Sefer Haberit. This name is based on uh, chapter 24, verses uh, 4 and 7, which recount that Moses put the divine commands into the writing and then read aloud the covenant document to the people who gave it their assessment. The title is of major importance for it is underscore the outstanding characteristics of the collection. Its divine source, social rules, moral imperatives, ethical injunctions, civil and criminal laws, and cultic prescriptions are all equally conceived to be expressions of divine will. All form the stipulations of the covenant between God and Israel enacted at Sinai. Unlike the ancient Near Eastern corpora of laws, the document here is not a self-contained independent entity. Rather, it is an inseparable part of the Exodus narratives. The narrative context is essential to the meaning of the significance of the document. So Israel's law codes have a unique context. Other ancient Near Eastern cultures had laws that were similar in form and content, but none were integrated into an account of deliverance right so that's the biggest message that israel has they have a promise and they were uh promised that they will be delivered and israel's laws is unique in that it is embedded in the story of the lord's salvation and desire to ensure the well-being of the people okay the preamble it's in chapter 20 verse uh 22 26 and the post uh script which is 23 verse 20 to 33 
of the Book of the Covenant contain warnings against idolatry, pointing uh, forward to the golden calf incident in Exodus 32. After that event, the text reiterates a briefer form of the book, which is in chapters 32, verse 12 to 26, as a renewal of the covenant that the people broke. Okay, so this is when the second stone tablets are brought. So, Mishpatim, right? Mishpatim or Mishpat uh, means decision, judgment, dispute, case, claim, measure, law, right? In the conscious dictionary of, uh, of the words in Greek Testament and the Hebrew Bible, it is uh, used as verdict, verdict or sentence or law or justice, okay? So, Mishpatims are enactments, decision, judgments, or disputes that are presented to the people as options uh, uh, and because the people, even though they have accepted uh, what the Ten Commandments say, God is presenting it to the people because uh, later on, in the next couple of chapters, is when it's ratified and is made legal by the sprinkling of the blood, etc., etc. So, that is Mishpatim. So, the Hebrew Mishpatim originally meant judicial rulings and then came to be used for legal enactment, enactment in general, that is, authoritative standards of conduct okay here they are sp specifically formulated in a casuistic style meaning if then right if you do this then this right and so this week's our portion starts following way English says the following. These are the laws you are to set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife, when he comes, she is to go with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master. And only the man shall, be, shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or, or, or the doorpost of, uh, and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. So the list of Mishpatim enactment begins with the, the 10 laws regulating the institution of slavery. None of them, but none of the, the other law collections uh, from the ancient Near East O opens with this topic. Hammurabi's, for example, deals with slavery last. The priority given to this subject by the Torah doubtless has a historical explanation, having recently experienced the liberation from bondage. The Israelites enjoined to be especially sensitive to the, con the conditions of a slave. So it's saying the Israelites have just left Egypt um, and gone out of slavery. So the first enactments that God is presenting to the people is how you're going to treat slaves and foreigners, okay? And it's, and it's a way to start off by maintaining yourself grounded and humble, understanding that even though I have chosen you, even though there was a promise given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you have become that fulfillment, remember that you were a slave, right? So anything after that has to be grounded on the fact that you were a slave before. So you shall treat anybody that is your brother or foreigner according to the respect, the justice, and the righteousness that will be uh, instilled in the commandments and in the instructions of the Torah, okay? So when an acquired reduction of an Israelite to slave status could result from, po could result from poverty or insol insolvency. By self-sale, the desperately poor could gain a measure of security. The labor of a debtor or a thief could discharge the debt or compensate for the stolen property. There are scriptural indications that, in a practice, defaulting debtors or members of their family will be subject to seizures by a creditor and forced into service. Whereas in the prophets, that denounce this practice in Mesopotamian law actually provide for the seizure of the debtor's rabbinic tradition interpreted the present text as a referring specifically to the Israelite thief who is legally sentenced to work of the value of a stolen good. And so what it's saying here is that the whole support here and the whole reason for the instructions of the slave is not so 
you understand that or believe that God is supporting slavery, but he's explaining that for in the case of a slave uh, is obtained, meaning the reason why you have a slave is one, he voluntarily wants to work as a as a worker, as a, as a servant, or if he is in debt, the way of paying off that debt is to work for you for a certain amount of time until he's able to uh, pay the debt, or after seven years, he's to go free, okay? So, the contents of the book seem jumbled with unrelated laws in various forms. The sequence has raised questions and created tension for casual readers and scholars alike. The book includes the laws regarding slavery, human violence, injury by dangerous oxen, restitution for theft, uh, property damage, living in the use of power over most vulnerable, uh, worship integrity in the face of corruption or hate, Shabbat laws to protect the poor, and rules for religious feast days, right? So there's a lot of elements that we see in this Torah portion. Many of these laws make the reader aware of the great historical distance between the ancient culture and our own, right? So we have to understand that there's a very uh, big separation from us to what is happening right now in the, in the narrative. They reflect the settings of the most, most of Israel's history, that is, re, re early agricultural life in Canaan. Now, the lower status of women and implicit acceptance of slavery in whatever form are disturbing and require the reader to understand the cultural limitations of that specific time. Concerns about the assumptions certain laws make have caused some to dismiss the authority of the biblical law or the Old Testament in general. And so what it's saying is that for you to understand these laws, you have to understand the times and the situation that uh, uh, culturally uh, was lived then, right? This is why God is giving these instructions because they will have to live in a society where there's other nations, the Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, right? And they all have um, their laws and their enactments, right? But what is interesting is that these enactments are, are mainly established by kings uh, and the deity is not really involved. The deity is only included in a case of uh, retribution or a gift uh, and support. But here we see that the, the the deity itself is the one giving the design and the structure of of the legal process and slavery and the process in which a woman will be able to marry and given back if if uh, if not uh, fitting uh, the husband or vice versa is based on uh, inheritance uh, and and honor and shame and so there's a lot of of all those elements into these commands, understanding that at the time, uh, unlike today, honor and shame and the dependency of a, of, of, of a woman and, and a man was much different than what it is today. And so that is why these commands are given, okay? And so do not mistreat or oppress. So we're gonna go into Exodus 22 because I wanna focus on certain specific uh, pointers that God is trying to focus on, right? Because right now they have re left Egypt. And so the idea is for them to stay focused, understand where they came from, that as, so that as soon as they start marching, being blessed, that they recognize that they were slaves and now they're free. And so their acceptance uh, uh, rate has to be uh, very, very big. They have to be understanding. There will be people that will be wanting to be part of them because of their God. And so God is giving them the instructions of how to manage themselves in his presence and to approach him so that those that come in learn and see that we have just laws. Okay, so it says, Then I mistreat or oppress the foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. And that is something in those times that was not a good thing, right? They needed uh, that structure to be in place. So four laws in verses uh, 21 and 27 address the wrong use of power over the vulnerable and, max and, and marginalized people. Two prohibitions regarding resident aliens, widows, and orphans are followed by two case uh, laws concerning uh, poor uh, debtors. Nowhere else in the book of the covenant does God speak about any law so personally and passionately. Um, justice 
it was not an idea that worked itself out in, in ups and downs of this life. In relation to God, justice was not a passive concern, but an immediate, immediate and active. So the idea of applying these just laws and putting so that uh, the community will be protected and those that were in, 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 in a lower stature would be able to be protected as well, okay? And so God informed and, and, and shaped Israel's relationship with other vulnerable people by insisting that they not turn their tables of power and function as the oppressor. Through the act of remembering that they were aliens in Egypt, God's deliverance from oppression became a predict for Israel. The word, if they cry out, was certainly, I will certainly hear and I will kill you, re revealed that God was bound to the law. Okay, from the very beginning, Israel needed to remember that it had no monopoly on God's compassion. And this is a, a, a callback to when they also were in Egypt and they also cried out. And we see what happened when Egypt oppressed. Right, so God is trying to teach Israel, okay, now that we have been delivered, you need to follow and lead by example. And remember that I had already demonstrated to you how I deal with oppressors, okay? Uh, and so uh, Exodus 23 says, do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put innocent or honest person to death. For I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe for the bribe blinds those who see and twist the words of innocent. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourself know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. Okay, so a big emphasis on this because this is the point. The point of the commandments, the point of the structure is not so that we can boast our, uh, how perfect and how beautiful uh, and how wonderful we are and how special we are as people, but that we have to remember that even though God has made us his treasured possession, we were slaves and we were oppressed. And in that oppression, God destroyed the oppressors. And so we cannot become oppressors because God will destroy us because God is order, structure, peace. And so that honor that God has given us, we have to um, maintain it and defend it with humbleness and respect for others, okay? Because we were aliens and foreigners too. And God embraced us and gave us access to his kingdom, okay? Because remember, this is his kingdom, not ours, okay? So, for six years, Exodus 23, you are to sow your fields and harvest your crops. But during the seventh year, let the land un unemployed and, and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it. And the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days you will work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. Okay, so here again, the focus on the foreigner, the focus on that person that is coming from the outside, right? Because that is the mission, that is the purpose. Okay, we have to preserve us ourselves, of course, as obedient people, but we have to also preserve those that are coming in and be patient and be willing to understand that, hey, you were a slave and a foreigner too. Okay, and so you have come, and now because you have come, you cannot boast. You have to understand that you have to stay humble because Israel received the Torah because of Abraham's faith. David received his promise because of Abraham's faith. And, God, and, and his obedience and, and representation of the deity. And Israel has been redeemed because God remember his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? So it's not because we have done magnificent things. It's because God is faithful to his word. He's faithful to his promises. And so as long as we seek his will, then he will be faithful to us. And as long as we stay faithful and humble, he will protect us and help us and guide us to help others. So, the two Shabbat laws in this part of Exodus differ from the other uh, the three Shabbat texts in their motivation. Uh, Exodus uh, 16, verse 23, 
uh, Exodus 20 verse 10 and 31 15 through 17 the offer the other state the purpose of the Shabbat in relation to God's holiness and resting in creation which is very important of course but here the focus is on the providing for the poor and for the beast in of burden the seventh year rest for uh, follow fields let the land lie unemployed and unused applies also to the vineyard and olive grove in this way the poor may get food from it and the wild animals may eat what they leave and parallel text in Leviticus 25 verse 1 through 7 and 20 verse 22 emphasizes the Lord's provision the seventh day rest also points to those who bear the heaviest labor rest so that your ox and your donkey may rest and the slave born in your household and the alien as well may be refreshed the Lord's concern for sustaining and restoring the most vulnerable the poor and the non-human creation is again at the forefront Moses' conversation with the Lord on mount, the mountain continued briefly before Moses went back down. The people immediately agreed to the Lord's purpose, covenant, the proposed covenant, and three acts of confirmation followed. First, the people participated in a ceremony uh, and acceptance. Then 74 men partially ascended uh, the mountain and ate a meal with the Lord's presence. And Moses then ascended to the top to receive the stone tablets while the people watched the fiery cloud of the Lord's glory surrounding him. Moses remained on the mountain for the longer period this time in order to receive the detailed instructions. And so here we see how Moses is approaching the cloud, approaching the mountain, and how Adonai is preserving him as he goes in and comes down. And we see how God has chosen Moses as that royal messenger that is going to uh, have access to the holiness of Adonai. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, 70 elders of Israel, and you're to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went up and told the people the Lord's words and laws, they responded, one voice, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Moses then wrote everything on the, the Lord has said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men to offer burnt offerings, sacrifice young bulls as fellowship offering to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it on the bulls, and the other half splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, and we will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you, in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, and Adam and Abihu, but the seven the elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instructions then moses set out uh with joshua his aid and moses went out to the mountain of god he said to the elders wait here for us until we come back to you aaron and, and her are with you and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them when moses went out to the mountain the cloud covered it and the glory of the lord settled on mount sinai for six days the cloud covered the mountain and on the seventh day the lord called to moses from within the cloud to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went on up to the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. And so, this is the conclusion of the Torah portion. There is obviously fifty-three commandments. Uh, we didn't go over all of them, of course, um, and so I wanted to focus on the main points uh, because. These instructions and these commands are legislations of the community, how the community was going to handle certain situations specifically. Um, and after they accepted it, then obviously they were binded by uh, the, the, their confession and they're binded by the, that blood that was sprinkled on them. And so they were in a covenant with God and now God was going to write everything in stone so that it was, um, uh, to an extent, in a document that is um, legal. And so that's what we're witnessing right now, right? The, the legality of the covenant and how God um, presented it to the people and the people accepted it. Uh, and so 
we see a lot of magnificent things. Moses in the mountain, thunder, cloud, uh, uh, Moses entering and into the most holy place uh, on top of this mountain, right? Because it is understood that there is three levels of holiness separating in the mountain. The people, of course, where the elders uh, and Aaron and the, and the priests are, and then uh, Moses being able to go into the cloud of fire and be at the presence of God. And so this is a gradual elevation from chaos in Egypt um, into that cosmic center. Uh, like I spoke last week, they believe in many cultures that that center of, of, of the world was where the cosmic portal of the heavens was, right? That meeting from the heavens and earth was on top of the mountains uh, as a reference. And so here we have Moses having access to the top of the mountain and God's manifestation, uh, having him given him access uh, to his presence. And so this is a magnificent thing. Um, and what is interesting is that um, the first thing that it is presented is slave, right? And the, the conscience of the slave is that if he came by himself after the sixth year, on the seventh year, he can leave by himself. If he came with a wife, then he can leave with his wife. But if he has wife and children given to him by his master, and he uh, his uh, sl a slave uh, time and work is done, then he is to leave without the wife and the children. And I, I connected it, I connected very very profoundly with this because um, we all become servants of God, right? A, a, a bed. Um, and we become servants of God and we give our lives to God. Um, we are no more uh, walking in our own will. Uh, we are men that are trying to bend our will to God's purpose and design and purpose. And it's interesting how uh, as, as a servant myself, I came into the covenant by myself. I came into um, this service more than slavery, this service by myself, and God has given me um, wife and children, and I will forever say that I will stay and serve my master, because he has given me everything, and I love him, and so I hope that uh, we all learn from this, this small command of slavery that we might see it as a negative thing. Uh, speaks profoundly of the relationship that God as our master and us as his servants. Uh, the best case scenario is that as God provides for us, we seek to stay with him because he is the greatest master, the greatest father that we could ever have and want. And so I hope you guys learned something new. I hope you guys if you didn't, hope you review something and uh, are able to grow and keep on walking. Uh, next week, we'll get into Teruma and we will be at Casa Israel Yara, CIY, uh, at, at the youth service. Um, so I'm going to put the address somewhere down here. You're welcome to come and see the worship, the praise, and the teaching uh, in our congregation English service. So that's all I got for this week. Uh, thank you for watching. I don't know anything. I just know what I know. A couple resources. That way you guys know where I'm learning all these things from. Like I said last week, this one. This one is going to be good for next week. Um, the Sunder Van, the Shredded Bible, and the JPS Commentary. Uh, so, that's all I got. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Uh, Shavuot Tov. And Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.